We really uh, appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing here at Google in, in um, education. So a couple years ago, we started thinking about ways that Google could help with computing education. And we wanted to find ways where Google could really uniquely contribute. So, I, I mean, let's take a step back. Why should Google care about this? And it's a really important question. One of the things that is really important in, you know, to us from our perspective is that we, you know, we feel that computing education is a really, really essential thing to be thinking about in the 21st century. Technology is everywhere. So if we're going to use it really effectively, we need more and more computer scientists. We need more and more professionals in all domains thinking about computing and understanding how computing works. So it's a, it's a big challenge, and it's one that we really feel is important to meet. And we're working with a lot of companies and a lot of organizations, including Jan's working groups in the NSF, to, to figure out how to meet this challenge and really focus in on how we can help with computing education. So. Going back to a couple years ago when we were trying to figure out what is it that Google could do to help, one of the areas that we, uh, we focused in on, it has to do with our mission statement. And our mission statement is that we um, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. So during the course of doing that, we have built up this really significant and powerful infrastructure that makes it possible not only for you to find things very easily on the web, but it also makes it very um, efficient for us to be able to deliver results in content you know, at scale on the web. So this is one area where, again, Google could uniquely contribute in an education space. So we really focused in on that first. The other thing that we thought a lot about um, when we were trying to figure out how we were going to um, operate in this space was just recognizing that, that Google also has a really deep base of computer science knowledge here. And it's just a function of the way we hire. We hire really, um, um, we, we hire experts in computer science, in all areas of computer science. And it's, uh, many of them are former educators. So it's a, it's a really, nat it's a natural resource for us. And it's uh, that along with the infrastructure, again, is something that, you know, if we just take a look here, we want to leverage our infrastructure and our computer science knowledge to encourage teachers and learners to innovate. So how do we do that? Well. One of the ways that we kind of hit on was to try and build and test models of curriculum that can spur innovative grassroots development. So these models of curriculum have to do with computer science, they have to do with computational thinking, they have to do with figuring out how to use really simple programming to enhance learning of math and science in, in K-12. So we really wanted to, to identify what are some of those models and then build some of them, test, test them a little bit. I mean, we're in this great position, unlike many of you, which is that we don't have any constraints of standards. We don't have to worry about the things that educator, educators and administrators have to worry about. We can just you know, find a school that's open to having us spend an afternoon with their kids, test something out, see if it works, and just kind of move along that way. So we're able to come up with really kind of innovative, out of the box thinking because we don't have those constraints. So it's, it's a great place to be. And, and one of the, the focuses in, in, in the models that we've developed is that you know, you're know you all you know, working with young people all the time. So you know that there's a really avid um, use of technology by kids. It's almost ravenous use of technology by kids. And it's, uh, it's, it's interesting if you really focus in on um, consuming technology, what we really want to do is take the next step to having them create the technology. And you know, it's really not a big step. You'd be surprised how, how kids just take to this and how easy it is for them to think this way. They really just, they kind of do it already anyway. So we want to make that step really small so that we can empower them to actually be the creators of technology in the 21st century. So a lot of our models for curriculum focus in, in these areas. So we, um, we, we kind of get these little germs of ideas. We put them out there, and we use our infrastructure to support development of a community around you know, maybe taking those ideas a little farther or maybe coming up with a completely different set of ideas. Whatever it is, we want to build the community and then we want to use our infrastructure to deliver at scale whatever it is that people come up with. So that's really what we, kind of the themes of what we focus in on. So let me just get a little bit more specific about some of these areas. We have three areas we work on in terms of the models for curriculum. We have the undergraduate computer science, which at the, um, the college level, the university level, that's com uh, computer science specific. We have um, at the high school level, it's a little bit more computational thinking, and I'll tell you what that means in a, in a minute. 
And then at the, uh, the K-12, so middle school and going into high school, we're focusing more on, on in, using programming to really support the math learning. This third bullet has to do with the, um, the infrastructure I was talking about earlier, where what we really want to do is we've got so many tools, products, search, all the different things that Google does, uh, whether it's our, our, you know, our spreadsheet or a word processor, we've got SketchUp, we've got so many different things that we use that can be used in an educational context. And they're already being used. This has been going on for years. So that's one area of you know, really, important, uh, re really important contribution that Google can make. And, and everything's free, I should add that. Uh, the other thing is um, we've for, also for years been doing a lot of um, outreach, what we would think of outreach. It's just supporting individuals through internships and scholarships, supporting organizations and foundations through partnerships, all funding, whatever. All of these things that we've been trying to do for years, all in support of you know, that, that whole idea of getting computing education out there and really supporting. Uh, any organization or company that's actually doing this kind of work. So we've done a, a, a lot of that over the last few years and continue, we, we will continue to do it going forward. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get into the curriculum a little bit. I'm gonna start at the college level. I know that's absolutely irrelevant to you, but it also gives us a really good example of how we do things. So it's, it's just, I'll just talk for two minutes about it. So what we've done is about three, four years ago, we were making this observation that you know, at, at the college level for computer scientists and computer science faculty, they have the same kind of pressure that anybody else does in any kind of academic discipline in college. They gotta get tenured, you know? They've got all of that pressure on them to do all the things that they have to do to get tenured. And typically teaching and curriculum development is kind of at the bottom of the list. So add on top of that for a computer science professor, the pace of technology. So not only do they not have time to sort of do what any academic would do, they also have things changing on them constantly. So it, it's been our observation that there's, you know, the computer science curriculum at the college level gets out of date really quickly. So how can we help, you know, instructors and faculty members at the university level update their curriculum um, as easily as possible? So, you know, this is a good example of what we were talking about earlier, where we create kind of a model put it out there and use our infrastructure to try and support a community developing around it. So what we did was, um, I'm just gonna try and get online here real quick. If you go to google.com slash edu, we have this nice website that has just about everything any educator could ever possibly need. Um, just a, tell you really quickly, I wasn't online before, but Google for Educators, this website in particular, has lots and lots of content and um, curricular materials around our applications and all the things, that, all the ways that, that one could use that in the classroom. So I just wanted to point that out. Google Code University is the example I just wanted to, uh, to mention. I was just talking about it at the uh, college level. So what this is, is it's a website that basically um, has a number of content areas that are very current. Things like cloud computing, parallel computing, web security, web programming, things that are really state-of-the-art kind of skills that we really would like to have our, uh, um, our students know coming into industry. These are things that are really very important. So over here on the side, we have a lot of the, uh, the topic areas. And what we did um, in typical style, I mean, this again is sort of the way that we do things, is we seed it a little bit. So we put some of our content out there. We write maybe some of the tutorials, we might do some of the slide decks just to get things rolling. So for example, if you look at distri distributed systems here, there's a set of tutorials. There's, um, and, and the tutorials and the course content can range from you know, being a couple of projects to being some slide decks and speaker notes and a project that might work with those, that slide deck to being a complete course that somebody might have donated. All of this stuff is donated content or it's a little bit of stuff that we have seeded in order to kind of spawn off that development. So the idea is that if you have, um, you know, you're teaching an operating system course and rather than do that three lecture thing that you usually do on the history of IBM mainframes, why don't you take that part out and put something in on, you know, do three lectures on distributed computing. Well, the, the lectures are here. You know, you've got the slide decks, you've got, you can go through tutorials so that you can answer the questions that the kids might have. You've got a project that goes along with it. So any, any number of different things. So if you kind of go down here, you'll see that we have a, a large number of colleges that have 
contributed. And that's really on any of these areas, we, get, we did the seed content and then we build the community around it. So that's just to give you a good sense of sort of the, the way we try and do things with, uh, with our curriculum models. Okay. Okay, so that's at the college level. Let me just go back to now talk briefly about the high school level. So at the high school level, what we're trying to do here is um, focus in on helping, helping students learn programming easier. So this could be non-technical students, it could be technical students. And the idea is that, you know, having men, many of the people working on, uh, in this curriculum have taught programming for many, many years. And one of the things that you notice is that, you know, you start talking about some of these constructs in programming languages and they can, they can be kind of abstract when, when students first see them. So when they look at that, it's like, eh, you know, they don't quite get it. But if you can connect it to something in the real world, it just, it just goes, it happens. You know, they, the, the light bulb goes off and they get it. So there's some, you know, a, a simple example, it's a, is, is a bad word, decomposition. You all know what decomposition is, there's actually many not so positive uh, definitions of it, but decomposition as a computational thinking skill means that I've got this big problem and I'm gonna break it down into parts that are easier to solve. So I could have the problem that, you know, I'm gonna write a calculator program. I'm gonna write a calculator. And I might break it down into three parts. I, I have to have some way of getting the input. You know, somebody's gotta tell me what numbers to calculate. I need to process those numbers, so there's gotta be something else, that's a second step that has to do the processing, and I have to display the results. So right there I took this, I'm going to create a calculator, and I broke it down into three steps. That's decomposition. So you teach high school students this, and you take them through this process, and they're kinda like, I don't quite get decomposition, you know? They kinda see it, but they don't get it. So connect it to the real world. And you can say, like for all of you, well, I came to a workshop at Google this morning. That's my big statement. Okay, break it down. Well, I got up, I ate breakfast, I took a shower, got in my car, and I drove here. So five steps. Now break each one of those down. I'll let you kind of figure out how you got up out of bed this morning. Uh, or take a shower, you know, all these things. You could break this down again and again into all these different steps. If you connect it to their real world sort of functioning, all of a sudden they get what decomposition is. So long story short, what we have done at the high school level is we've created about Oops, about 30 modules where um, we connect, you know, the teaching of some programming language construct or some, you know, uh, it could be about the history of the internet, it could be how the, how the web works, all, any number of different concepts. And we've created these little 10 to 15 minute interactive kind of project-based discovery-based kind of learning that if I'm a computer science teacher at high school and I'm teaching iteration or teaching whatever it is that I'm going over that day, I got this little thing I can inject in there for 10 minutes that's going to make the connection for them. And we've tried to make it really generic so that it really can kind of come in and not disrupt anything. It's really, you know, it kind of fits. So CS for HS is our means for getting that seed content out and then again hopefully building a community around it. CS4HS is a Carnegie Mellon program that uh, we've sponsored for many years now and we're really going to be ramping up over the next, uh, next couple years. Um, it's a two to three day workshop uh, for computer science high school teachers to go to a, col a nearby college campus and, and be taught by you know, the, the faculty there or Google engineers, whoever might be available because other people, other companies sponsor this as well to you know, teach, them, teach them some basic computer science concepts and, or, or take them wherever they are and, and give them some professional development uh, to take them to the next step. So that's a, that's a program that, again, this models of curriculum, what we're trying to, to focus in on. I'm gonna go a little further afield now. This is a little more experimental. Computational thinking. Have, have you heard that term this morning? <laughs> Do you have a definition in your mind for it? Would you be surprised to know that very few people have a really solid definition in mind for it. It's one of those things that could mean a lot of different things because computation means so many different things. Um, for us, in terms of what we've been trying to come up with with our models of curriculum, it means abstraction. And abstraction is um, a term that we define, and I actually look it up in the dictionary, it's defined as taking a really complex real world situation removing all the details that you really don't need so you have a model that captures the essence of that real world situation, 
And then you take that model and you use computer science techniques to implement in, inside of, of a computer. And then once it's inside the computer, you solve problems about the real world in the context of the model. That's what computer scientists do all day long, every day. Every computer science here, Google does this. This is just, it's the essence of how we think. It's how we're wired. So abstraction is sort of this over, well, it's foundational. It's a foundational thing that we all do. So, whoops. Abstraction could be a thing. You take a look at this map. We've got uh, Los Altos Hills here, and you know I've got all the houses and all the trees and all this. You don't need any of that if I want to know how to get from point A to point B. Get rid of all those details. Create an abstraction, which is a map. That's the you know quintessential example of an abstraction. An abstraction could be a process. It could be that you're noticing patterns in someone's behavior or some process that's just repeated again and again and again. Uh, what we have here is an accountant's worksheet and a calculator. Some brilliant computer science scientist many years ago, let's create a spreadsheet out of that process that is, that's just repeatable again and again, or that behavior. So this is how sort of abstractions played out over the years, you know, and it's, it's given us some of our most powerful tools. Now, if you were to decompose the abstraction process, you all know what that means now, right? Okay. Then the first thing you have to do is you actually have to recognize a pattern of behavior in the real world for which you're going to do whatever you're going to do with. But you've got to recognize the pattern. And then once you recognize it, you generalize it. You have to get rid of all those details that you don't need. And then once you have the detail, or you've gotten rid of all the details, you write some algorithms around it so you can get it implemented into a computer. And then you write the program that's actually going to manipulate the model. So those are the four steps that we go through. OK, now that's, that's kind of how we think of computational thinking. When we got into the K-12 area and started thinking about ways that we could help there and what would be some curriculum models, we, um, I mean, the first thing we did was, well, you know, let's bring the scope down. And we said, well, there must be some way to do something in math or STEM. You know? So we brought it down at least to that, uh, brought the scope down at least that far. And then we started thinking about math in, in particular. And we wanted to find, you know, what is one of the biggest pain points for, for students as they go through a math curriculum? What's that, you know, the most challenging transition? And we met with a lot of teachers, a lot of math teachers, and one of the things that came out of those discussions was when they go from arithmetic to algebra, it goes from something that's very concrete, it's like, how many fingers am I holding up, to 3x plus x equals 4. You know, it's just like night and day for kids when they first see this, and it's a big challenge to get through that transition. So we heard this again and again, is that this was one of the most difficult things that, that teachers were having to get students through and that students were experiencing. So we were thinking about this and thinking about that. And what happens in computer science is you start with an abstraction and then you use programming to make it concrete. You know, you look at a program and, and you know, assuming you know how to read programming languages, you can actually see the, implementa the implementation of the model in that, in that code. So you go from abstract to concrete. The problem with the students was they were going from concrete to abstract. So we were trying to figure out, is there a way to make this abstract a little bit more concrete with programming? So we were trying to, you know, what would be a sequence that we could take kids through to first of all make patterns more obvious in, in this abstraction process, but then maybe use programming in really, really simple ways to make it more concrete. So here's our, our process. Um, Again, we, we did a lot of this uh, talking to teachers, looking at, at the standard ways that things are taught in textbooks, that uh, things are taught in the, uh, in the classroom. And what we noticed was that patterns are everywhere in math. They are just, you know, they're really ubiquitous. You can find patterns in all the different areas of math. And um, it's just not brought out in the textbooks necessarily. It can, it can be maybe a little bit, but not really explicitly all the time. So the fact that it's, it's not brought out and that the, you know, the teachers aren't always bringing it out, we thought that this was a, something that we really could focus in on, regardless of whether we end up doing coding or not, just making the patterns more explicit, explicit and, and applying that part of the um, abstraction process. So what the, the workflow we came up with was you got some basic algebra concept. You have the students identify a pattern in it. You have them generalize the pattern. Then you have them write an algorithm for recognizing the pattern. And then, you know, if you want to go the whole nine yards, you actually have them program the algorithm so that they have a concrete representation of that abstract concept. 
Okay, this is like the worst thing to do to you after lunch, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> you all remember perfect squares. Okay. okay, pattern recognition, very simple. This is very simple. Uh, x squared plus 6x plus 9 equals x plus 3 times x plus 3. You remember that, right? Got another example up there for x plus 4 times x plus 4. So just as an illustration of this, this whole process I just showed you, what we do is we, we have some worksheets that we have kids come into a computer lab. So, you know, stay, say they're studying factoring for four days in the classroom, maybe on the fifth day, We've got some supplemental materials that they can take in the computer lab. We have them work in pairs, just it's called pair programming. And they're worksheets that take them through all of these steps. So the first step is to recognize the pattern. You know, to recognize that actually, you know, three plus three and three times three, that's what really makes it makes a perfect square. That's the thing that really is there. So the same with four. And then we get them to generalize the pattern, to actually represent it. You know, if k is four then it's 2k and it's k squared. So generalize the pattern once you've made these observations and recognize the pattern. So we take them through step by step and then you know, explicitly define what the pattern is. The next step is to define an algorithm. So we just have a representation. We take them through you know, some variable names and you know, what are b and c? Well, in this case, it's 8 and 16. So you end up with this equation b over 2 and square root of c. That's, you know, b over 2 is three or four, square root of c is three or four. If they're equal, you know you have a perfect square. So you find this little algorithm that, that helps them recognize the pattern. And, and then you can even factor it. You know, so b over two is gonna be that value. So once you go through that whole process with them, again, going through these worksheets and they're kind of going back and forth and they're on the computer and they're writing stuff and they're very interactive, very discovery-based, we have them actually program it. But we only, they only program a tiny bit of it. They only program the part that they recognized and that they generalized. So they are only gonna write the code for the yellow part. Everything else we give them. But you know they read it, and they see it, and they understand it. I mean, input what's B, input what's C. So they get what that means, and when they run the program they can see what it means. But they only add the parts that they've recognized. So they go through and do this, they run the program, and they have a solver now for, that recognizes perfect squares and factors them for them. What's really cool about this example is that you've got the, um, the plus ones. Well, if you just enter negative six or negative eight for B, the same program works. It just works. So then they have a solver for X minus three times X minus three. If you take a look at you know, something down here that's not a perfect square, you still have this multiplication of three times two in addition of two plus three. So that pattern is still there. You add a couple more lines to the program and you can factor anything that doesn't require the quadratic formula, but anything that is gonna sort of work. And it's just this, you know, and this is a 40 minute session, they go all the way through this, they're creating a solver for a whole class of problems, and they've done it because they recognize the pattern. We have another kind of pattern that we've been working with. We've got the, what we think of as pattern to program, which is the process I just took you through. There's this equally interesting one, which is a program to pattern, where you actually take, you know, they just are working in, this is called Python, it's a, it's a programming language, and it's just it's totally simple, you know, it's just not, you know, it's not visual, it's just you're at a little box and you're typing this stuff in. But one of the things that, that we've been able to uh, uh, use this for is this discovery learning, where, you know, there's tons of identities in math. Well, if you can take them through so that they can actually discover the identity themselves, as opposed to, you know, you read it in the book and then you use it, it's much more powerful. So in this particular language called Python, we have this function called pow. And pow xy just means x to the y. And you type that into the command uh, line and it's like pow two zero, that's gonna, you press enter, it'll give you a one. Pow 894 zero, press enter, it gives you a one. Have them do that like three or four times, recognize the pattern, and then have them represent and generalize the pattern. All of a sudden they've got an identity. There's an algebraic identity that they discovered. I mean, there's a couple more examples here just with POW. Um, but, you know, there are any number of ways to take them through some really simple examples and have them recognize the patterns from it and get an, get an algebraic or any kind of an identity from it. Okay, I wanted to also just briefly mention that we have 
um, we're working on this entire science, uh, math curriculum through high school. We're going to have these modules, uh, these types of modules, as well as the computational thinking. We also have one of our teachers working specifically in science because there's so many hooks into science. Again, focusing on computational thinking and really critical reasoning skills. So, so what we're really not that much involved in is you know simulations and things like that 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 we might do. Um, um, you know, of which there are many, many examples of that type of uh, application. Another place where Google is uniquely qualified to sort of, you know, be in the space is with data. We do everything based on data. So it seems like an interesting thing to take on to help students be more aware of data. So we call this data skills. And you can, you can think of a sequence of modules similar to what we just described here, where they go into the computer lab and they do some things with data. So what is data? How do you create it? How do you find it? How do you work with it? You know, what are some simple analysis tasks you can do on these small data sets? You know, just to sort it. How do you sort it? You know, when do you sort it? Why do you, what, what, what do you need to think about in order to know you need to sort it? And then once it's sorted, how do you bucket it so that you can actually do a pie chart or whatever it is that you want to do? What are those simple abstractions? Which do you use when? How do you, you know, what is standard deviation versus mean versus median? All that really basic stuff, getting into a little statistics, but always going back to the data and building these skills and these instincts around, around data. So this works into our, sci our middle school science curriculum. And we, um, we have one of our teachers working on a set of modules around data skills. We also have a whole team here at Google um, headed by Hal uh, Abelson, who is working on a really interesting project called App Inventor, which is a scratch-like visual programming interface that sits on top of Android. So what that does is it allows for non-technical students to very easily build Android applications and, and you know, actually implement them and execute them. Oh, Android. Android is our, I can't carry my phone. Uh, it's a phone that Google had. There, it's one of those. Uh, Android um, is a um, software development environment for mobile technologies that's open source. So this is something, this is a Google product and uh, there's Google phones. And basically what it is is that it allows any Java programmer out there who wants to to build mobile phone applications and it's all open source. So it's all open. So um, what App Inventor is then is it's an uh, interface that sits on top of that that makes it very, very easy for anyone to, to build applications. And we're working it into our science curriculum in a really interesting way because I should have that phone. Sharon, give me your phone. The other thing that is very interesting about these phones is their sensor devices. So it, it knows where you are. There's GPS in here. It, it, it knows all kinds of things about what's going on in your environment. And there are other things that are being added to it all the time. So you can imagine going out in the field, using this phone to collect a bunch of data for some science experiment. You just stand there and it collects it. And then you walk over there and it collects something else. And then you come back into the classroom, maybe you do a little application that processes the data, you know, helps build these data skills. So we're, we're working very directly with this team to, to you know, build up um, at least three or four modules in our science curriculum that are focused around um, mobile phones and how you can use those for data, uh, data collection and visualization and all the other things that go with it. Um, okay, the, the last thing I wanted to say then was um, we feel really, um, uh, fortunate to have you know a great relationship with Jan because the way that we view our work in conjunction with hers and what's going on in many other organizations is what, what we'd like to do is if we have this sort of going along the entire high school math curriculum you know these mod this, just this little programming stuff that kids are learning maybe once a week our hope is that at the end of that process if they've gone through this from eighth grade on that they'll know how to program by the time they get by the time they graduate, they'll just know how to program because they just got it in their math class. And it wasn't programming per se. We didn't sit down and say, okay, here's a while loop and here's how you do this. They see it and they work with it and they see how powerful a tool it is just to help them do their math. And it supports the learning of their math in a really powerful way. So you have that go all, through, all the way through high school and we're hoping that it just builds a huge volume of students who want to take these computer science courses, as well as just increases the awareness and the sensitivity of everyone to technology and, and, and helps them see how they can actually start creating it. So that's sort of what we're, we're thinking about in the long term. Okay, thank you.